Welcome, everybody, the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for being here, all of you heroic men, enduring the days of winter, going to work early every morning, taking care of business, and doing what your head tells you to do when your head tells you it must be done. You all who ignore your heart's desire to indulge your body's seductive whisper. Instead, you boldly heed the clarion call of responsibility to those you are strong enough to support and brave enough to love and care for. You are the army of the righteous. You are the noble knights defending the fortress of civilization against those hungry hordes of scheming, surging savages trying to invade and conquer what you and your fathers have built, knowing that even in its wrecked ruins, those savages will live better than in anything they could build themselves. Only you stand between the nightmare of socialistic slavery and the bright hope of tomorrow. And you, you beautiful, brave women, resisting government's treacherous proposal to marry it rather than accepting the ring of one clear-eyed man dreaming of a shared tomorrow. You gorgeously courageous women who smilingly and graciously carry the load of work, marriage, family. You inspire your men to greatness and nurturing your young ones to moral maturity as well as physical. Yes, you ladies and gentlemen who do all this and have done all this. Yes, you are the natural audience for the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. You are the audience I devotedly serve, recognizing every day that I can bring you the helpful life-affirming insights of ancient Jewish wisdom to be a day of privilege. Yes, it is indeed my honor to serve you and my delight to welcome you to another episode of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Yes, that's right. The only show in the entire digital universe that reveals how the world really works. And one way the world really works is that entertainment is enormously powerful and influential. Movies have done a great deal to shape American culture over the last 100 years. And there are so many examples, but one of my favorites is the story of Mutiny on the Bounty. Now, there have been three movies about this. One was in 1935, famously starring Clark Gable as uh, Fletcher Christian, the mutineer, and Charles Lawton as a steely, cold-hearted, cruel Captain Bly. Uh, then in uh, 62 came Mutiny on the Bounty, I think perhaps most famous, Marlon Brando playing Fletcher Christian the Mutineer and Trevor Howard being Captain Bly. And then more recently, well, it's a while ago, 1984, was Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins. And uh, in their, each in their own way, each of these three movies served to so distort the truth about the, what really happened in the mutiny and the uh, of, on the bounty, that I'm quite sure that unless you have personally made a study of the topic, your assumption is probably that Bly was a cruel, vicious captain who brought the mutiny on himself through his own fault, and uh, and that the heroic mutineers. Uh, all they wanted was to live an idyllic life on a deserted Pacific island where all was fine. And I'm sure that that's the image most people have. And that is the image uh, that was conveyed by these three movies. 
so established is that incorrect picture of what really happened that we even have the phrase, he's a regular Captain Bly, meaning just an impossible uh, person with authority, uh, overwhelming and negative and cruel and capricious. Well, the only problem with all of this <laughs> is that it didn't happen. It just isn't true. It's not what happened. And uh, anybody who's interested in can actually easily research the history of the, the mutiny on the bounty. I would recommend for your attention um, my late friend Richard Grenier, G-R-E-N-I-E-R, -E uh, wrote, I think, perhaps the definitive work on explaining the, the reality of what happened on the bounty and how uh, distorted it has been by uh, the various movies that have been made. But uh, this is very much a story of, of what really does happen in the world today. And uh, we, ha we have to know that movies simply do distort the reality very seriously. Why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that back in 1850, an American writer who some have called the greatest of all American writers. I'm not, I'm not sure I would go as far as that, but, but certainly a great writer by the name of Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, wrote a book called The Scarlet Letter. And um, the, the story of The Scarlet Letter is uh, a story which I will, I will tell you briefly in, in, a, in a short uh, while. I will tell you. Uh, but the interesting thing is that a movie was made on it uh, of it um, starring Demi Moore and um, also um, uh, an actor who has recently become renowned for uh, playing Winston Churchill. So it's okay, so this movie was done in 1995 right so what's that 20 23 years ago of the as of the time i'm recording this particular show and uh, and obviously uh, a lot of time has elapsed from when the story was set in the middle of the 17th century to when the movie the scarlet letter was made in uh, at the end of the 20th century uh, it's 150 years since Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the book. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the book. I want to tell you a little bit about the movie of 1995. And then I want to offer my suggestion that America has possibly changed more in the last 23 years than it did in all those previous years. In other words, the gap between the time that Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote um, The Scarlet Letter and the time that The Scarlet Letter movie was done in 1995, obviously there were huge cultural and social changes that took place in the country. But um, it is just possible that the changes from 1995 to 2018 are greater than the changes that took place between 1850 and 1995. Well, that's, that'd be a bit much, isn't it? But nonetheless, uh, I think that there is something to that argument, which is why I intend presenting it to you. And we'll do that just as soon as we get back. The uh, website to which I urgently call your attention is mine. It's rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, it's there that you can read a little bit about the organization that it is my privilege to serve called the American Alliance of Jews and Christians. And uh, the work of the American Alliance of Jews and Christians, I should tell you, um, is that uh, I am utterly persuaded and this will come as no surprise to regular listeners of the show. I'm utterly persuaded that the only way to survive the, the major threats 
facing us now? What are the major threats facing us now? I don't think it's global warming. I think the major threats facing us now are the alliance between secular liberalism and Islam. So what sort of alliance is that? Well, that's not for now. But I think that that threatens the core culture that gives America specifically and Western civilization in general its strength. And I do believe that uh, like all civilizations before us, if we do go under, if this is the dying gasp of America, God forbid, then it'll come about not because of external enemies, but it'll come about because of an internal collapse, an internal erosion of the will to live and the internal erosion of a reason to live. That is what brings down civilizations. And if ours is on its way out, that is what it will die from. It will die from suicide, not murder. And the good news there is that if we wish to postpone that collapse, then fortunately, we don't have to conquer anybody else. We just have to conquer ourselves. We don't have to gain mastery or control over any other nations. We just have to gain mastery or control over our own. We just have to recover the morale, the moral foundation of our existence to renew our will to live, our, our desire to live. And uh, I believe that in the same way that the erosion is being uh, done by more than anything else, by uh, Islam and secularism. In that same way, I do believe that the only way for it to be restored, the only way for our culture to get back, is through an alliance of Jews and Christians. And that's what the American Alliance of Jews and Christians is about. You can see it at aajc.org, American Alliance of Jews and Christians, aajc.org. It's also a page on my website at rabbidaniellappin.org. Excuse me, correction, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, there, too, you will find on special the uh, download of an audio program called The Perils of Profanity, uh, You Are What You Speak. And this is a one-hour instructional audio on improving your elocution improving your ability to articulate ideas and communicate with other people and now is as good a time as any to work on improving that area of our lives it impacts in other words being able to communicate honestly and transparently and effectively makes for a vastly improved social and romantic life and a vastly improved business and professional life as well all of that at uh, rabbidaniellappin.com, and I return in just a moment, so please stay right where you are. Hello, everybody. We're back with the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, your rabbi here, and uh, we're talking about Nathaniel Hawthorne's book, The Scarlet Letter, uh, written in 1850 and turned into a movie in 1995 starring Demi Moore, and Gary Oldman. Uh, Gary Oldman uh, did a terrific portrayal of Winston Churchill in last year, in 2017's um, The Darkest Hour. Uh, uh, I talked to, about it a little bit in last week's show, but it was uh, it covers a short period of World War II, early in the war, 1940, just after Winston Churchill became Prime Minister after Neville Chamberlain. But... Uh, at any rate, look, uh, the purpose of this discussion is not to tell you, whoa, guess what? Breaking news. The movie version of The Scarlet Letter is nothing like the book as it was originally written. <laughs> I mean, that's hardly news. Uh, we all know that Hollywood does, uh, does its thing with books. <laughs> we understand that. And I wouldn't waste your time talking about that. 
But no, we're talking about something entirely different. There is actually, um, there's no reason for them even to have called it the Scarlet Letter, other than hoping to um, dishonestly piggyback on Nathaniel Hawthorne, really, because um, it, it has so little to do with it. Let me put it this way. Um, if Nathaniel Hawthorne, instead of writing American classics, if Hawthorne had been writing Harlequin romances, you know what Harlequin romances are, right? There's always a, uh, a big stand of them in the bookstore. And long may Barnes and Noble and the other ind- and the other bookstores still last because uh, there's something wonderful about being able to go into a bookstore and wander the racks and see what's on there. Uh, but if you take a look in Barnes and Noble, it's always going to be a rack of Harlequin romances, and um, you can pick one up, any one you like. It makes absolutely no difference, and I'll be able to tell you exactly what the plot is. Uh, it's absolutely standard. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a love story. It seems impossible. It's, it's a wealthy guy, always wealthy, good looking guy and, um, and a sexy woman. And it doesn't seem likely and there are ups and downs, but eventually they get together. And on the way, there is plenty, um, uh, how shall I put this, uh, colorful and, uh, and evocative and, uh, and rather clear, uh, clearly depicted uh, amorous relationships. Okay, fine. That's Harlequin. Well, uh, that's not Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a fantastic book. Now, I'm not saying you absolutely have to go out and read it. I will be the first to admit that it is heavy going, but I will say that that it's a great book. It's filled with incredible subtleties, and uh, and it can almost be a little bit like decoding a a detective story or a mystery just in terms of catching on little by little as you go through the novel you catch on to the consistent imagery uh, his use of certain things like mirrors and reflections uh, or the way that uh, Hester Prynne the heroine of the novel is always called Hester but uh, the two male protagonists Dimsdale and um, <clears throat> and Prynne who, whose name changed to changes to Chillingsworth uh, how their names are they're sometimes called by name other times they refer to as their professions the minister and the doctor uh, and how uh, how uh, Hawthorne does this and what and 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 the effect that he's getting look you can tell I mean I I love that sort of stuff and I I'm just filled with amazement at the sheer brilliance and depth of understanding of a guy like Hawthorne uh, along comes Hollywood and turns it into, as I said, the 1979, The Scarlet Letter. Let's put it this way. If, um, if Hollywood ever tried to make a movie of the great novel Moby Dick, it would turn into Free Willy. <laughs> that, that, that kind of conversion, that kind of transformation of one thing into something that could hardly be more different and exactly the opposite. Uh, Moby Dick becoming Free Willy, that is no more preposterous than Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, uh, book of The Scarlet Letter becoming the movie The Scarlet Letter. Okay, so we need to take a quick look at what the book is about. Uh, this is going to be a really quick summary, okay? We're not even talking cliff notes here. I'm just going to give it to you in its in its brief form. But um, uh, we meet Hester Prynne in uh, Puritan Boston in the uh, in the mid 1600s, and she um, she's been away from her older husband Roger Prynne. He sent her ahead to find housing in the New World, and the plan was for him to follow her. Well, she's been away from him for more than nine months when uh, she turns out to be pregnant. The townspeople start noticing that she's got, uh, she, she's, uh, she's sick, she's, uh, she vomits, and pretty soon she gives birth to a little girl called Pearl, or she names her Pearl, and, uh, and the townspeople are horrified. This is clearly adultery, 
and they condemn her to have to walk around with a red A on her clothing uh, to identify her as uh, as an adulteress, and that it it violates um, a Puritan law at the time. And obviously, I mean, the the townspeople are depicted as a, a pretty um, well, as you could imagine. I mean, this is this is not admiring of their harsh and stern approach to life. Uh, this is only a little bit later than uh, witches had been burnt in Salem, so-called witches, and they you know talk about whether Hester is actually a witch or not. But anyways, um, so we don't actually ever see her getting pregnant. We don't see the conception in the book. She is already. And then it, later it comes out that uh, her lover who impregnated her is none other than uh, Pastor Dimsdale, the the uh, clergyman in town. And obviously his uh, uh, hypocrisy is revealed, but he doesn't come public. He, he remains silent and continues giving his sermons, preaching in church. And Hester, although subjected to serious punishments, refuses to name him. And again, uh, the, the uh, hidden reference there to Judah and Tamar in the book of Genesis. I mean, obviously, all to anybody who really reads this carefully, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. At any rate, um, what happens then is that um, uh, her husband, Roger, this older guy, shows up, and, he, and he's not a nice guy either, not a nice guy at all, and it turns out that he quickly, uh, he, he, he's determined, he, want, he tries to make Hester tell him who the father of the baby is, and he is horrified, he doesn't want to identify as her husband, because that'll embarrass him, and so she for, he forces Hester to not disclose that her husband has arrived. He changes his name from Roger Prynne to Roger Chillingworth, and uh, he tells Hester that if she discloses that he is her husband, she will um, he, he will um, torment um, the, the pastor who is the father of her child. Okay, fine. So then um, time goes by, and basically... Uh, Chillingworth is absolutely obsessed in an unhealthy and an obsessive way with uh, finding out who was the father of who's the father of Pearl, and um, uh, circumstances have him ending up sharing lodgings with the the pastor, and uh, little by little he starts um, figuring out that Dimsdale must be the person and. He uh, he pretends to be Dimsdale's doctor, and he's going to help cure him. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Dimsdale, who's basically a decent sort, but uh, he he he's trying to protect his position as uh, minister. Um, he, you know, he's 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 a weak guy, but um, but he's totally uh, taken over by his conscience, and he's in a in a, in a way that is revealing of. Hawthorne's understanding of psychosomatic disease, uh, Dimsdale is literally physically reduced to a human wreck by the weight of his conscience and by, the, um, by what he feels through all of this. And then at a certain moment when uh, Dimsdale is in a drug-induced sleep uh, caused by uh, Roger Chillingworth, his so-called doctor, uh, Chillingworth opens his clothing and sees something on his chest. And again, very brilliantly, Hawthorne doesn't tell us what it is, but it's something that makes the doctor dance with glee. And I've got to tell you, that scene where Dr. Roger Chillingworth is in an eerie, cackling kind of a way, dances. I'm talking about the book, by the way. I haven't started on the movie yet, just to remind you. This is pure book. Um, he, you can actually, I mean, in your mind's eye, you see him dancing with glee at what he sees on uh, the minister's chest. So we assume that it's a scarlet A, that somehow in a form of sort of spontaneous stigmata uh, that uh, that somehow or another um, Dimsdale has produced a replica of the scarlet A that 
Hester has to wear on her dress, Dimsdale now has in his chest. Or maybe could he have carved it there? Did he did he cut himself? We don't know. And we don't even know that's what it is. Uh, and later on, it's disclosed in public on a sort of a scaffolding where he dies later on as the story develops. And we still never know definitively, but that's what it seems it is. Anyway, um, eventually, uh, Dimsdale's decent side wins out and he reveals his role. Uh, this gives little Pearl, who seems to be a somewhat disturbed little kid, as you can imagine, because of the hostility of the neighborhood and the, um, uh, the, the townspeople are very negative. But all of a sudden, she now has a father and there's a touching scene between her and Dimsdale. And uh, Dimsdale dies. Uh, Roger dies, leaves some money for Pearl. Hester and Pearl um, go to Europe. Eventually, Hester comes back to the same house in the village. And uh, she's now a sort of, um, I'm not going to say a heroine, but she's she is this dispenser of goodness. She takes care of women in the village. And all of a sudden, after all the cruel um, ostracization of the first part of the book, she's now looked up to in, uh, in, in very lovely ways. Um, okay, so all, uh, all, all very beautiful, and it's, it's a fantastic story. Um, by contrast, the movie... Uh, very different. I'll tell you what I mean as soon as we get back. But first of all, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. And um, speaking about a uh, an instant download of my lesson called Perils of Profanity, You Are What You Speak, uh, that is a uh, very valuable lesson on how to improve your own communicative ability. I'm quite sure quite certain as you look around your orbit you'll have either friends or family family members who really could use a uh, an uptick in their ability to communicate uh, it's you know if people have trouble getting a job very often they don't know how to talk in an interview let alone what to say but even how to say it um in terms of progressing at work every 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 creation of profit involves a communication between two human beings it's unavoidable and so obviously there is an advantage to those who can communicate properly that's what this um, audio cd is about you can download it um, you can send it to whoever you want to gift it to and people's uh, lives really do change through an ability improving the ability to speak this website is rabbidaniellappin.com and take a look for the uh, program Perils of Profanity at rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, of course, I am none other than he, your rabbi, back with you in a moment. Hello, everybody. Your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Appen, back and on with the story. Talking now about a movie made in 1995 called The Scarlet Letter loosely based on Nathaniel Hawthorne's book, The Scarlet Letter. As I said earlier, loosely based means the way uh, if the novel Moby Dick was converted into Free Willy, that would be loosely based. What the uh, creators of the movie, The Scarlet Letter, did uh, with the with the book can't even be said to be loosely based. I mean, nothing at all to do with it. However, let me tell you, in a tribute to the wisdom of the American public, the movie was a financial bomb. Um, the actual numbers, if you're interested, they spent in round numbers $50 million making it. That's in 1995 dollars. So it's much more than that because there's been considerable inflation since 1995. Uh, I haven't worked out exactly what it is, but in ninety-five dollars, it's uh, they make the movie for fifty million dollars, and its revenue, its box off office revenue, is ten million dollars. It does not even make back twenty percent of what it cost, <laughs> which, by the way, is entirely just and appropriate because it is uh, the most appalling mess of a movie you can possibly imagine. But uh, just by contrast, by the way, I just to you know pull a movie, just to pull a movie out, uh, Paddington Bear, 
right? The movie Paddington that was uh, made, uh, I think it was made in, tw- was it 2017? I think it was 2017 or maybe 2016. But uh, Paddington is, a, is fairly recent. I think it was 17. And uh, the movie cost exactly the same amount, $50 million to make as, as The Scarlet Letter, except in 2017 dollars. So you could say it actually cost less to make. And whereas Scarlet Letter made a return of $10 million, uh, Paddington made a return of $75 million, and still counting, by the way. So uh, uh, let me put it this way. They've already made a sequel to Paddington, Paddington Bear 2, uh, which... I believe is even better than the first one for those of you who liked the first one. And um, uh, I think I can assure you very safely that nobody is going to do a sequel to the 1979, excuse me, I keep saying 79, to the 1995 movie of uh, uh, The Scarlet Letter. Okay, so uh, essentially it's changed from a tale of morality Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne does not um, warmly depict the townspeople of Boston. Uh, He portrays Dimsdale as the hypocrite that he is, that on one hand he's part of the crowd denouncing Hester for having a baby out of wedlock and committing adultery, which is a crime. Uh, But at the same time, um, you, you see the development of the characters, and they don't live happily ever after, by the way. Um, uh, Dimsdale dies, and Roger, her former husband, dies, and it, it's not it's not pretty. Uh, but what we are seeing, and and what we are being taught, um, is the idea of consequences to wrongdoings, the idea of right and wrong, uh, the idea of public morality, uh, the idea of human conscience, of good and evil. Uh, good people recognizing the existence of evil and evil people recognizing neither the existence of good or evil. Um, You you cannot read the Scarlet Letter without uh, being lifted uh, to a realm of deep thought where you contemplate these ideas um, in a way that uh, not everybody does. The movie, however... It's a Harlequin romance. And needless to say, by the way, uh, Dimsdale and Hester do live happily ever after. So, I mean, if if nothing else was changed, that in itself totally undermines the purpose and the intent of the novel. But uh, it's that's not the only thing. In the novel, uh, she is when we meet her, she's already expecting or has the baby. Uh, in the movie... Um, we are led to her spotting uh, Dimsdale having a swim in the local pond. And of course, needless to say, we absolutely inevitable. How can we not also see Demi Moore taking a swim in the local pond? Um, obviously, that is an essential part of the Scarlet Letter. And uh, pretty soon they succumb to their natural urges and eventually uh, the consequence is that little Pearl is born. And uh, the um, Dimsdale is portrayed as this hero, and uh, uh, it's a story of two lovers and the horrible negativity of local society that just doesn't understand the value of young love. And this incredibly complex relationship with her former husband in the book, uh, Roger, who sent her up ahead uh, to find the house. I mean, shouldn't he have done that? Shouldn't she have been able to stay back in England with family while he came and got things ready for her? So we get the idea that Roger is uh, no um, mother-in-law's delight. And uh, and he comes along and uh, and, and he's, he's instantly smitten by this incredible um desire for revenge an obsession for revenge so you know not not a great guy but uh in the in the book he is reduced to a two-dimensional character uh, he's he's almost a cartoonish stereotype he's this older guy who just doesn't want the young lovers to have any fun i mean he's just a real spoil sport is all he is and um and that's that's the story. That's that's how it goes. Um, 
obviously uh, our sympathies are entirely with Scar- uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Hester and and Dimsdale. Needless to say, if you watch the movie, uh, we everyone else is is dimwitted and and retarded. Everyone else is is repressive and oppressive. And uh, there's no, there's absolutely no substance to the story whatsoever. There's really nothing to even talk about. Um, however, interestingly enough, I feel that as much as there was a social change, and look, the good news is people didn't go see the movie. It got a bad rap out of the gate, and it was a horrible failure. So all of that is very good. But the movie makers, in thinking that this would work, really revealed their understanding of the time. And it's, it's no different now as it was in, in 1995, where many of these entertainment elites have a vision of America that is simply not true. Their vision of America has Hillary Clinton winning the election in November 2016, and they do not understand the people that elected Donald Trump. And so they thought that most of America would go for this movie. That did not happen at all. But uh, how about now? Well, things are very different now. Admittedly, adultery isn't a huge deal now. It wasn't then either. In 1995, when they made the movie, uh, they were right in assuming that that nobody would, or at least they were reasonably uh, justified in thinking that nobody would be shocked at the fact that they are exonerating adultery. Um, And uh, what do they, you know, what happens? Well, um, today, you know, would anybody think about pinning a scarlet letter on a woman as a child out of wedlock? Of course not, but that's true also in 1995. It wouldn't have happened. But now, in 2018, um, Hester Prynne wouldn't be the person she was in the movie. See, the movie made her this, uh, this heroine in a way, but now she'd be a victim. In the movie, this is the only part the movie kept true to the story, she does not reveal who the father of her baby is. She doesn't say it's Dimsdale. But in 2018, just think about what she would do. She would be on all the radio talk shows. She'd be lawyered up to her eyeballs. She'd be, um, she'd be the victim right? She'd say how uh, the minister took advantage, a figure of authority took advantage of her. She was just a poor recent immigrant. And, uh, and so as a result of that, she was, uh, she was the victim of the sexual assault. I mean, you know what, what would be going on. And so where Nathaniel Hawthorne's story in The Scarlet Letter has Hester Prynne as, as a real heroine, um, she realizes that you there's a price you have to pay for everything in life. Nothing's for free. And yes, you, you, you went and had this relationship with Dimsdale. It's not without consequence. And in the book, she never ever screamed, oh, life isn't fair. And she, she never even lashed out at Roger Prynne, her, her long time ago husband, for sending, I mean, all of these would have been legitimate, I think she could have said, what did you send me here for all by myself to, the, uh, to America? Uh, if you'd been with me, this wouldn't have happened. Or if you'd left me at home and you'd come here, this wouldn't have happened. None of this. There's a quiet dignity and acceptance of what is happening. And she certainly didn't uh, blame Dimsdale by saying, you used your authority to seduce me um, and you took advantage of my loneliness and so on. But today, the differences would be huge. And so the reason the movie The Scarlet Letter, it's very different from Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1850 novel, but I think that it's even very different from anything that we would rec- recognize as, as as normal behavior today. It's just too far gone. And so if, if they were making a movie of The Scarlet Letter today with the same indiscriminate disregard for the original novel, my guess is they would turn Hester Prynne into this victim of sexual assault from an authority figure, and it would be the story of how the town uh, reacts. Anyway, 
uh, it's it just struck me as interesting because from time to time um, I talk to people about the extent to which America has changed in the last 60 years. Um, you know, we, we, we came into being as a nation in 1776, but people were living here 100 years earlier, 1676, and people were living in North America, I mean, uh, uh, Europeans were living here 100 years before that. So uh, we've been here for a good few hundred years, and everything pretty much in terms of the values that hold a culture together pretty much everything stayed the same until about i always say 1962 you know that i'm not putting a specific date on an epochal change but uh, it's a it's a good a time as any and i have certain uh, identifying characteristics of that period that uh, that that would signify major changes and sure enough, uh, my argument is that the changes in America between 1962 and now are huge. They're much bigger than the changes that took place in America between 1676 or, if you like, uh, 1660 and, uh, and 1960. I think those change, yeah, technological, obviously, I don't have to tell you that. But if you uh, take away the technological changes take away all technological changes and what you're left with are values and culture and ideas and beliefs and the social glue that holds us together i think you'll agree that the changes taking away taking away technology changes between 1660 and 1960 uh, were minimal in those 300 years but the changes between 1960 and 2018 huge forget the technology the changes in culture were huge in the last 50, 60 years. And for anybody who doesn't uh, recognize that or, or see it easily, um, the, the movie, The Scarlet Letter from 1995, is interesting because it comes across today as very quaint, very old-fashioned, in a weird sort of way, because it's not intended. You know, if you ever watched on on a rerun on late night television, they wouldn't intend it as a historical period piece. They'd sort of view it as contemporary, but it isn't, not even close. The website is rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, the um, resource that I want you to get hold of is called um, the You Are What You Speak. It's called The Perils of Profanity. It's not only talking about the use of vulgarities and uh, and profanities and obscenities in language, although it does touch on that as well, but it, it talks in general about how to be more effective in your communication. And I can't believe for a moment that uh, either you or people you know or people you love are not in need of that improvement in life, and uh, an enormous improvement it is. The Perils of Profanity at RabbiDanielLappin.com. Back with you in just Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the final segment of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, uh, where we look at things that never change. The more that things change, the more we have to depend on those things that never change. And uh, one of them is the misunderstanding of the role between people and animals. And I just I felt you know we've 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 covered the story of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter in the movie, uh, but on a deeper level, I'm still talking about the conflict between two different ways of looking at reality: the Nathaniel Hawthorne approach and the Hollywood approach. And I don't think there is any doubt in my mind as to which one is how the world really works. Uh, Hollywood is seldom going to provide us with that kind of insight, but great books do. And I'm not going to say that uh, The Life of Pi, uh, written by a Canadian author, is, is necessarily a great book. I'm not even going to say that I think, oh, you absolutely have to read it. But I am going to do something that I very rarely do on this show. And that is, I'm going to read you a couple of pages from the book. This may be a total failure. This, this may not at all come close to giving you what I'm hoping to impart by this little exercise. 
Uh, and perhaps it would be better were I just to tell you about the content rather than read it in his words. That may be a mistake, but I'm going to try it anyway, and I'm going to depend on your feedback uh, in order to find out whether this was a failure and I should not do it again, or whether you got the same value out of hearing these words as I got out of reading them. The, uh, the, the thing that never changes is the, um, the struggle between a correct interpretation and understanding of human-animal relationships and the wrong. The wrong one is the one that is prevalent today, which depicts human beings as just another form of animal and also imparts to animals um, anthropomorphic characteristics where people start treating their pets as if they are their children and uh, the culture now says I don't own a dog I am the guardian of a dog and this is quite prevalent um, as opposed to uh, the understanding that humans and animals are quite different uh, the understanding that if I can save a child's life by doing some medical testing that's going to kill 20 little bunny rabbits, I wouldn't hesitate. But when I say I wouldn't hesitate, I am not necessarily speaking for all Americans because too many in our population today are not persuaded of the superior value of a child to 20 bunny rabbits. It sounds ridiculous when you hear me say it, right? But it's true. And if you're not sure, ask Maybe you have a child or a grandchild that goes to a gig. Uh, maybe you, you have a friend. But if you can talk to a high school, uh, you know, a, a teenager who attends a government indoctrination camp and ask them this question, you know, ask them if you had to choose between saving a baby you don't know or 20 bunny rabbits that have been in your family for five years. It's one or the other. Either the 20 bunny rabbits die or the baby dies. And it's a baby you've never met. You don't know who it is. What would, what would you choose? If you had to press one of the buttons, what would you do? I think you'll be shocked at the result and the answer. And also, I uh, am, am so disappointed with the negativity surrounding zoos these days. Um, zoos used to get very good funding from, from cities, People would be members of the zoo. Uh, an outing to the zoo is always terrific, and it's still good. It's still nice. But a zoo is not the place that it used to be, and that is because many people, deep down and again, please try this on a teenager who attends a gig, uh, people have ambivalence about putting animals in cages. It's a huge problem. Uh, the One of the best aquariums, that I used to love taking my children to, I wouldn't do it today, uh, is the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, we used to enjoy going to various SeaWorld shows. You're not allowed to do this anymore because the movie Free Willy helped everyone realize how evil it was to put animals in cages. Fine. So I wanted to read to you, um, if I may, uh, a passage from the book the Life of Pi. I'm not talking about the movie again, please. I'm talking about the book. Early in the book, page 15 is where I'm reading from. Um, I, I hope this works for you. I really do. But anyway, here goes. I have heard nearly as much nonsense about zoos as I have heard about God and religion. Well-meaning but misinformed people think animals in the wild are happy because they are free. These people usually have a large, handsome predator in mind, a lion or a cheetah. Funnily enough, the life of a gnu or of an aardvark is really, really exalted. R-A-R-E-L is really exalted. They imagine this wild animal roaming about the savanna on digestive walks after eating a prey that accepted its lot piously or going for calisthenic runs to stay slim after overindulging. They imagine this animal overseeing its offspring proudly and tenderly, the whole family watching the setting of the sun from the limbs of trees with sighs of pleasure. The life of the wild animal is simple, noble, and meaningful, they imagine. Then it is captured by wicked men and thrown into tiny jail cells. 
Its happiness is dashed. It yearns mightily for freedom and does all it can to escape. Being denied its freedom for too long, the animal becomes a shadow of itself, its spirit broken. So some people imagine. This is not the way it is. Animals in the wild lead lives of compulsion and necessity within an unforgiving social hierarchy in an environment where the supply of fear is high and the supply of food is low and where territory must constantly be defended and parasites forever endured. What is the meaning of freedom in such a context? Animals in the wild are in practice free neither in space nor in time, not in their personal relations. In theory, that is a simple physical possibility, an animal could pick up and go, flouting all the social conventions and boundaries proper to its species. But such an event is less likely to happen than for a member of our own species, shall we say, perhaps a shopkeeper, with all the usual ties to family, to friends, to society, to drop everything and walk away from his life, with only the spare change in his pockets and all the clothes on his frame. If a man, boldest and most intelligent of creatures, won't wander from place to place, a stranger to all, beholden to none, why would an animal, which is by temperament far more conservative? For that is what animals are, conservative. One might even say reactionary. The smallest changes can upset them. They want things to be just so, day after day, month after month. Surprises are highly disagreeable to them. You see this in their spatial relations. An animal inhabits its space, whether in a zoo or in the wild, in the same way chess pieces move about a chessboard, significantly. There is no more happenstance, no more freedom involved in the whereabouts of a lizard or a bear or a deer than in in the location of a knight on a chessboard. Both speak of pattern and purpose. In the wild, animals stick to the same paths for the same pressing reasons, season after season. In a zoo, if an animal is not in its normal place, in its regular posture at the usual hour, it means something. It may be the reflection of nothing more than a minor change in environment. A coiled hose left out by a keeper that has made a menacing impression. A puddle has formed that bothers the animal. A ladder is making a shadow. But it could mean something more. At its worst, it could be that most dreaded thing to a zoo director. A symptom, a herald of trouble to come. A reason to inspect the dung. To cross-examine the keeper. To summon the vet. All this because a stork is not standing where it usually stands. But let me pursue for a moment only one aspect of the question. If you went to a home kicked down the front door, chased the people who lived there out into the street and said, go, you are free, free as a bird, go, go. Do you think they would shout and dance for joy? They wouldn't. Birds are not free. The people you've just evicted would sputter, birds are not free. With what right do you throw us out? This is our home. We own it. We have lived here for years. We're calling the police, you scoundrel. Don't we say there's no place like home? That's certainly what animals feel. Animals are territorial. That is the key to their minds. Only a familiar territory will allow them to fulfill the two relentless imperatives of the wild, the avoidance of enemies and the getting of food and water. A biologically sound zoo enclosure, where the cage, pit, moated island, corral, terrarium, aviary, or aquarium is just another territory, peculiar only in its size and in its proximity to human territory, that is, that it is so much smaller than what it would be in nature, stands to reason. Territories in the wild are large not as a matter of taste, but of necessity. In a zoo, we do for animals what we have done for ourselves with houses. We bring together in a small space what in the wild is spread out. Whereas before us the cave was here, the river over there, the hunting grounds a mile that way, the lookout next to it, the berries somewhere else, all of them infested with lions, snakes, ants, leeches, and poison ivy. Now the river flows through taps at hand's reach, 
and we can wash next to where we sleep, we can eat where we have cooked, and we can surround the hole with a protective wall and keep it clean and warm. A house is a compressed territory where our basic needs can be fulfilled close by and safely. A sound zoo enclosure is the equivalent for an animal, with the noteworthy absence of a fireplace or the like, present in every human habitation. Finding within it all the places it needs, a lookout, a place for resting, for eating and drinking, for bathing, for grooming, etc., and finding that there is no need to go hunting, food appearing six days a week, an animal will take possession of its zoo space in the same way it would lay claim to a new space in the wild. Exploring it and marking it out in the normal ways of its species with sprays of urine, perhaps. Once this moving in ritual is done, and the animal is settled, it will not feel like a nervous tenant, and even less like a prisoner, but rather like a landholder, and it will behave in the same way within its enclosure as it would in its territory in the wild, including defending it tooth and nail should it be invaded. Such an enclosure is subjectively neither better nor worse for an animal than its conditions in the wild. So long as it fulfills the animal's needs, a territory, natural or constructed, simply is without judgment a given, like the spots on a leopard. One might even argue that if an animal could choose with intelligence, it would opt for living in a zoo, since the major difference between a zoo and the wild is the absence of parasites and enemies, and the abundance of food in the first, and their respective abundance and scarcity in the second. Think about it yourself. Would you rather be put up at the Ritz with free room service and unlimited access to a doctor, or be homeless without a soul to care for you? But animals are incapable of such discernment. Within the limits of their nature, they make do with what they have. A good zoo is a place of carefully worked out coincidence, exactly where an animal says to us, stay out, with its urine or other secretion. We say to it, stay in, with our barriers. Under such conditions of diplomatic peace, all animals are content and we can relax and have a look at each other. In the literature can be found legions of examples of animals that could escape but did not, or did and returned. There is the case of the chimpanzee whose cage door was left unlocked and it swung open. Increasingly anxious, the chimp began to shriek and to clam the door shut repeatedly with a deafening clang each time until the keeper, notified by a visitor, hurried over to remedy the situation. A herd of deer in a European zoo stepped out of their corral when the gate was left open. Frightened by visitors, the deer bolted for the nearby forest, which had its own herd of deer and could easily support more. Nonetheless, the zoo deer quickly returned to their corral. In another zoo, a worker was walking to his work site at an early hour carrying planks of wood, when to his horror, a bear emerged from the morning mist heading straight for him at a confident pace. The man dropped the planks and ran for his life. The zoo staff immediately started searching for the escaped bear. They found it back in its enclosure, having climbed down into its pit the way it had climbed out by way of a tree that had fallen over. It was thought that the noise of the planks of wood falling to the ground had frightened it. But I don't insist. I don't mean to defend zoos. Close them all down if you want, and let us hope that what wildlife does remain can survive in what is left of the natural world. I know zoos are no longer in people's good graces. Religion faces the same problem. Certain illusions about freedom plague them both. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely why I wanted to read to you this beautiful piece. That last sentence, religion faces the same problem. Certain illusions about freedom plague them both and how true that is. That's as far as we can go for today's Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. Thank you so much for being part of the show. You there is what makes me be here. Thanks to those of you who've helped promote the show and uh, encouraged others to share it. Um, you can use YouTube because whenever the show is released every weekend, I always uh, place it on YouTube and on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And uh, if you would share it with others from there, I'd really appreciate that. My web, my uh, my YouTube, and did I say YouTube? It's there as well, by the way, Rabbi Daniel Lappin channel. Facebook is at uh, is Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Twitter is at Daniel Lappin. 
and my website, rabbidaniellappin.com. Take a look at the perils of profanity. I think you want it. Uh, I'd go more than that. I'd say, I think you need it. And so until the next week, when we are again together here on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, I want to wish you all a week of good health and prosperity. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.